Hi, welcome back to the very basics of U.S. politics and institutions. And this is the lecture that kind of looks at the founder's idea about how you can uh, harness factions um, and use political parties and interest groups as these intermediating ways of representing people. We last looked at this concept of representation. We talked about trustee versus delegate. Um, we talked about the problems of even knowing or measuring public opinion. I ask you to think about what it's like to be an elected official and imagine how you would even know what people want back home in the district. And, and part of that comes out of this reality that um, our institutions don't simply aggregate preferences, but it's this interaction between intensity and preferences that matters most. And people who become political activists are activated. I mean, an activist is just a normal person who becomes activated about something and they really want to see change. That's just kind of natural. Uh, but we need to go back again to how the founders thought about this. Remember that the founders wanted to create a system that would be unlike the centralized system in Europe, which people would be elected into um, these representative assemblies. Now, when there was the battle that went on between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists over the structure of the government, um, a big concern in the articles of, and a big concern in the Federalist paper, papers are about uh, factions. And so the, the founders came up with a system in which they believed naively there would be no political parties. I want to take you through a little bit of Federalist 10. Now, we know now that James Madison wrote Federalist paper number 10. Remember as well that uh, the Federalist papers were arguments in favor of people ratifying the Constitution as it was originally written before the Bill of Rights was added as a compromise. Um, and among all of the many concerns in the Federalist Papers, the tendency towards faction proves to be the most nettlesome and common. Um, remember, these are written on deadline to try and persuade you in real time to go out and vote in favor of the Constitution. And the typical structure is, hey, here are problems with human nature. And, and what can you do about it? Well, guess what? The Constitution, as it's been designed, actually handles all of that for us. Okay, the problem of faction. When you and I think about a faction today, we might think about political parties or these interest groups. But James Madison, the author of this piece, in particular, didn't think about that distinction. He thought of factions that were minority factions or factions that were a majority faction. And <clears throat> a majority faction could really impose its will on the interests of the minority. And for Madison, faction is sort of a dangerous thing, but it's also inevitable. Pay attention to this definition. By faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or a minority, so today we would think about it as like a political party or an interest group, uh, a minority or majority or minority of the whole who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Wow. Okay. What he's saying here is that a faction is a bad thing. Um, later on, you know, people kind of look at interest groups and say, it's a really good thing we have so many interest groups. But actually, Madison had a very different opinion about this. He said factions are, by definition, bad things because people will tend towards fa faction. It's inevitable. And when they create a faction, by definition, their interests are actuated by some common impulse adverse to the rights of other citizens or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. So factions are going to naturally form. Then in typical Federalist paper says, oh, there are two ways that we can try and cure the mischiefs of factions. One is by removing its causes 
The other is by controlling its effects. Well, what do you do by removing its causes? You take away people's liberty. We don't want that. Instead, we can try and control the effects by actually looking at um, how the new constitution is going to work. Now, this next phrase that I've highlighted from Federalist 10 is really interesting because he says, this is really important, the latent causes of faction are sown into the nature of man. It's, it's part of who we are. We would not be human without this natural tendency to bind together with others in groups adverse to the interests of others. It's power against power. See, the, the founders largely did believe that in a state of nature, we would form groups that would be adverse to the interests of the whole. So what do you do? Well, you can't necessarily just remove the causes, so you have to try and control the effects. And you do that by creating a system of government in which faction is set against faction. And you do that by allowing these factions, of course, to, to be robust, but by having layers of government divided in such ways that no faction ever takes control. Now, remember, he didn't distinguish between political parties and interest groups. Madison's idea here is that a faction will be used to counteract another faction and out of that, they would kind of nullify each other so that no dominant faction ever takes over. Think about um, the original Constitution and how they treated political parties. And you'll notice political parties are never mentioned. There's this idea in the background of a faction, but Fattison, Madison and, and the other founders didn't distinguish between parties and interest groups. And faction is supposed to counteract faction. In, in the presidential election, as is defined in the Constitution, whoever came in first place with the Electoral College vote became the president. Whoever came in second place became the vice president. That didn't change until the 12th Amendment to the Constitution. They were so confident that faction would counteract faction. They did not allow for the idea of political parties as they've been formed. Now, today, our government is run through, by, run through and run over by political parties. But the founders conceived of an, uh, a system in which parties would not exist because a faction would counteract a faction. What was the vice president's job? The vice president's job, the person who came in second place in the presidential election by design, that person was then made in charge of the United States Senate. The president of the Senate is the vice president of the United States. That's why the vice president you know, can cast the deciding vote when there's a tie in the United States Senate. Every vice president throughout our history through President, Vice President Truman had their main office nowhere near the White House. Their office was in the United States Senate. When, when you create political systems that assume parties won't exist, oh, you might be setting yourself up for some real problems. All right, I won't spend too much more time on that. I do want to yeah, distinguish about different kinds of institutional types. Um, in in, in old, old work on public administration, they used to talk about sort of old institutionalism. They didn't call it that. We call it now old institutionalism. Old institutionalism uh, would look at a building like this is the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and, and, and old institutionalism would kind of think about the the, the stability of the rules, the stability of their flow chart, of their org chart. You know, it, it, you would, maybe you would see institutional change, but, but it would happen during these bursts of reform. Only every now and then you'd get a big reform. And, and if you were coming to a place like the Kennedy School, you know, 60 years ago, you would have learned how to be a public administrator in the forestry 
Department or somewhere off in the Department of Defense. Um, and, and people thought about institutional change as rare, episodic, and usually when things were really out of whack. Now, new institutionalism kind of takes hold in the literature in political science sociology um, in the 1950s when they were able to use public opinion polls effectively, often coming out of the marketing literature and advertising literature. And then the unit of analysis was not necessarily the institution, but individuals within an institution. New institutionalism focuses on standard operating procedures, unwritten rules. If we talk about an institution, um, we talk about the institution of the family. Well, is that an institution like the Department of Agriculture? No. An institution of the family um, helps us understand, you know, maybe how people are going to behave. Institutions are, are helpful if they can help us predict behavior in certain situations, what standard operating procedures are about. So growing up in Wisconsin, of course, we cared about a new institutionalism thing like the four food groups. How do you end up with the four food groups? The Department of Agriculture didn't create it, it actually came out of an advertising pitch from dairy farmers, from an association of dairy farmers. And that was great when we were growing up. And then it changed to the seven food groups. Not nearly as great, but at least we had one of them, one of seven, not so bad. Now, many of you may remember when we had the pyramid. That was a big change and uh, a lot of debate. Because in this institutional reform, um, the things that we were supposed to use sparingly, like fats and oils, sweets, they're at the top of the pyramid, you know, where the Pharaoh is communing with God. It was a really political process. Does it matter? Yeah, it matters because things like the four food groups or the food pyramid structure how money is spent and how people approach nutrition in schools across the country. So it becomes a highly debated, highly contested area. Now the next step towards this was, of course, to undo the hierarchy and show some kind of fitness. And they redid the pyramid so there was no hierarchy and preference given to the oils and fats and sweets. And worst of all, it showed people needing to be active, which I, in theory, I guess I agree with. Now, fortunately, things have changed again, and this is the latest approach. And dairy is one of the five. It shows portion control. No more hiking up a pyramid. These are the two types of institutions. I need you to imagine that both are in play for you. It's easier for you to take a look at the institutional rules, the big structure that doesn't change, well, at least doesn't change very often. But much of what you and I care about in terms of politics are this sort of smaller changes, you know, a change in policy that will change how things operate and then change the rules. Rules, institutions, preferences, these things are all endogenous. They are all influencing each other. Uh, one way of thinking about it is the unwritten rule that most of us haven't even paid attention to. When you open up in a banana, most of you open it up from the side with the stem. But we know from watching the great apes and chimpanzees, that's not how they open up a banana. And they hold on to the stem and then they just kind of twist the other end with one little action like this. How did you and I grow up learning the quote-unquote wrong way of opening a banana? It's just what we're used to. It's what we were taught. It's what we think is right. And you shouldn't always assume that the institutions around us were somehow divined to be that way. It's the product of tradition, maybe, or more often than not, the product of political battles and manipulations. There are other institutions around us that kind of affect how we behave, and I want to tell you about one place in particular, and that's in Belmont, Belmont High School, where all seven of our children at one time have passed through. <laughs>
Belmont High School had in its old building a, a lunch hall that had a mix of long tables and of round tables. Now, in the middle school, all the tables were long. So you show up your first day at the high school and you have this mix of long tables and round tables. And you don't really know what table you're supposed to sit at. So you choose, you choose one, you sit there. Now, our, our children could tell us that after just a few weeks, certainly within a month, people were round table kids or long table kids. And in reality, people who sat at the long tables were more likely to be part of hierarchical systems. You know, if there's a hierarchy in your group, the cheerleaders will take over one of the tables and the queen bee is going to be at one part of the table. Or um, a sports team will take over another table with a hierarchy in that long table. Whereas the music kids and the drama kids tend to be at the rounder tables looking at everybody. The actual f space of the table has an impact on how we interact. Now, if you didn't know whether you were a long table or a round table kid your first day of school, you, you're more likely to sit at the same table the next day and it has a huge impact on how these kids would interact with school. The institutions shape us, shape our behavior in ways we're not even aware of. Here's another long table. This is the Senate Finance Committee in the 1950s. This is before committees were opened up for the public for everyone to see. You'll even see down at the end here, there's a spittoon. Now, seating in these uh, committee hearings, in their committee meetings and hearings, was based on seniority. So at the end of the table, you'd have the chair of the committee, in this case representing a blue party, and then seating around the table would go based on the seniority within that committee. So the next most senior member is sitting just next to the chair, and the most senior member of the red party is sitting close to the chair. If you're a new member of this committee, where do you sit? At the little kid's end of the table, right? You, you can't even necessarily hear what's going on at the other end of the table. You're entering in a conversation that goes from years before to now. And as time goes on, you're going to get to sit closer and closer to the head of the table. But as you're at the kid's end of the table, there was often a bottle of alcohol or maybe just a Pepsi, and you're talking face to face with the person across from you and getting to know each other and building a sense of belonging. And what do our committees look like today? They've been opened up to the public, which in many respects might sound like a good idea, but one thing it clearly does is it changes the dynamic of the interactions among the members. Because now you are playing to an audience and playing to the cameras and you're not having conversations with each other. The new members are those down dais members, the ones who are at the far ends, as far away from each other as they can possibly be. They don't talk, they don't get to know each other, and people are playing to the crowds. How do they get things done? Well, not in an open public forum, because it's for posturing and not for work. The, the, the structure of the room has an impact on how you're going to behave. The table has an impact on how you're going to behave. Now think about all of the political institutions that we have and how they have an impact on how we might behave. Like behave yourself in your political parties. The founders thought they'd created a system in which there would be no political parties. Madison was so proud of himself, pat, pat, pat on the back. And yet we have two political parties. Why? Well, it's because of the way we run elections. It's not some kind of magic thing. These are just examples of Senate districts in Texas. But um, what I want you to notice is that there are these different colors, these different areas. And within each one of these districts, only one person gets elected and whoever gets the most votes wins. And that's generally how we run things in this country. Who wins? Okay. These are the rules. Single member districts, only one person is going to win. And whoever gets the most votes is going to win. It's called the first past the post or FPTP system. Okay, that's like the way things ought to happen, right? So if you have these six individuals running for office and they're going to have a campaign and these are the outcomes, 
who wins? Well, single member district plurality rules. Single member district, one person wins. Whoever gets the most votes wins. Custer wins with 27% of the vote. Congratulations, right? It's democracy in its proudest form. But in equilibrium, meaning if you run this thing over and over again, or if you think about it and act strategically, what happens? Well, Brown came in second place, and I'll tell you, Brown knows what she's doing. She certainly knows what she's doing. And so Brown's going to say, listen, if we keep going like this, Custer's going to win and win again. What we need to do is form a coalition. Okay, so Brown talks to, oh, let's talk to Blitchfeld. Okay, so you know what? You don't run. You have, you have all your supporters support me. And, and when I'm in office, um, what do you want to be in charge of? Oh, manufacturing? Fine, you can be in charge of manufacturing. And then she's going to hit Amin. And what does he say? Hmm, okay. I want to be in charge of, hmm, health policy. Sounds good to me. And now you run that election with Blitchfeld and Amin out supporting Brown. And Brown wins. But what happens in equilibrium? Well, Custer's no fool. She cuts the similar kinds of deals with Senzano and Darosa. And then Custer wins. In equilibrium, in the long run, with single member districts and plurality rule, you get two political parties. That's why we have two political parties in this country. We do not have two political parties because agricultural areas versus the cities, no. Catholics versus the Protestants, no. Rich people versus poor people, no. It's a direct result of single member districts and plurality rule. You could actually look at constitutions around the world, and there are really smart people like Matt Sugart out in California, UC San Diego. He can look at all these institutional rules, and he'll say, aha, in equilibrium, seven parties. Oh, over here, in equilibrium, five parties. Madison, as smart as James Madison was, did not see this coming. Faction will be made to counteract faction. What you end up with is two political parties with these electoral rules. Now Madison at the end of his life has started learning about a different form, proportional representation, right, going on in Europe. How does that work? Well within a proportional representation system you want to pay attention to things like a threshold. A threshold is above this level everybody gets to divide the seats proportionately. Below it, no. And then something like district magnitude which is, okay, uh, how many seats are there per district? If you have, for example, in this case, a district magnitude of 100, it means everybody represents the same jurisdiction. That's like in the Israeli Knesset, everybody in Israel is elected for the same jurisdiction. The entire Knesset is elected countrywide. Now, we could do that within states. You don't have to have district lines the way that they're drawn currently. And then the political parties actually represent um, interests aligned with maybe individuals or economic backgrounds or religious backgrounds. And then with this particular thing, you'd have a party list. So every party would be able to have a list of 100 members and Blitchfield would put his name at the top of his list, and Brown would put her name at the top of her list. And you kind of go through the party list for as many seats are allocated. So let's take the same outcome, right? Same exact outcome with the different rules. If the threshold is 15%, now you're going to divide the seats available by these proportions. You'd have 27 seats going to Blitchfeld. You'd have 32 seats going to Brown, and you'd have 41 seats going to Custer. No one has a majority, and then within this kind of electoral system, they put together coalitions. It's why the Italian government's always falling. It's why the, the Greek government can never stay together, because their coalitions collapse. Um, in political systems with proportional representation and 
thresholds, their parties are more representative uh, of the people's preferences, of their interests, than the Democrats or Republicans in this country. But their systems are less stable. More representative, less stable. Is there an opening for a third political party in this country? Probably not. Not easily and not through the normal process. Instead, what happens is that a third party gets gobbled up by the second party. If you think at a national level, purely at a national level, what was the last electorally successful third party? It was the Republican Party in 1860. The Republican Party existed four years earlier. They didn't come in first place. But then the Whig Party split and the Republican Party emerges more strongly and won not a majority of the votes, but a plurality. There were the Whigs, the Democrats, and the Republicans. The Republicans won. The last electorally successful third party candidate in American history at the presidential level was Abraham Lincoln in 1860. There are important roles that parties, third parties play, bringing issues to the floor, getting us to talk about things and think about things in new ways. Personally, I want to see a different party system in this country. I would like to see different ways, but our two party system has locked themselves into place and won't allow for real competition. It's a result not of some grand, specific, well-intentioned design by the Founding Fathers, but an oversight. When Madison came to understand the dynamics of European-based PR systems, it was like, oh my goodness, we should have done something different. But it's hard to undo. Political parties are important mediators. They're important ways of aggregating people's preferences. Let's go back to Madison. So in, in Madisonian system, in the, you know, you've got this Federalist 10, it's going to be the case that groups are naturally forming and they're going to try and balance each other out. But one thing that's crucial is that these groups that form are not kind of all on top of each other. Their differences don't reinforce each other. So these factions not being reinforcing, some people are members of the green group and the yellow group. Others are members of the green group and the red group. And their interests are, are, are overlapping. Their memberships are overlapping, but not reinforcing. And that's a natural part of it all. Now, you've heard of Tocqueville, I hope. <laughs> And I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about democracy in America. Tocqueville toured the United States. He was a child of the French aristocracy. And at the time that he had toured in the United States, the French Revolution, of course, had failed rather dramatically. They installed a, a Republican form temporarily, and ultimately they were taken over by uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and went through several systems of government and Tocqueville was a later born child of this relatively aristocratic family and like many later born children of an aristocratic family uh, he wanted to tell his parents who had lived through the French Revolution um, how it could have been done better. Uh, he travels to the United States of America and sees it in 1831, largely spending time in New England. So he doesn't capture all the diversity of culture that uh, we know existed at the time. Um, and he's really trying to understand how is it that democracy worked in the United States, but failed in France. And he writes later on great length about the failures of the French Revolution and lessons from the French Revolution. But part of what he's trying to do here is explain to his family um, how it really could be if they had done it right. So what is it that's unique about American democracy that 
you can only really see if you're coming in from another country. I don't know if you've had that feeling of visiting another country and everything looks so like the colors are different and the, the money is different. Like even go to Canada, their money has colors on it. It's like, wow, is this real money? You start noticing things in different ways. His senses were so heightened, right? And part I want you to pay attention to is especially this section on political associations in the United States. Now remember that, that Madison said the tendency towards factions are sewn into the fabric of who we are. We can't do anything about it. Uh, we can't take, get rid of this tendency. So we're going to come up with these institutional fixes that, that have faction counteracting faction. But by definition, a faction is a bad thing. Um, you really have to try and control them. Tocqueville had a much more optimistic view of political associations. And he, 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 the, we are a nation of joiners. We, we join all kinds of interesting groups. Very much unlike um, in the French Republic at that time where um, it, you actually had to be part of a, uh, a registered group to be part of a group at all. So it was kind of regulated from the governmental level, but not in the United States. Um, this is a part of that that chapter, chapter 12, that I really want to highlight. and and. I know that it sounds a little crazy because it's an old kind of line, but I want you to pay attention to it. The citizen of the United States is taught from infancy to rely upon his own exertions in order to resist the evils and the difficulties of life. He looks upon the social authority with an eye of mistrust and anxiety, right? We are natural. This is what we've been saying, right? We know that we can't trust government. We know that you can't trust people in positions of authority. Power corrupts. Yeah, everyone believes that absolute power corrupts. But in the United States, we believe that power corrupts, no matter what. People have a tendency towards avarice and ambition. So you better not trust people in positions of authority. So, Tocqueville's looking around. Citizens are taught from when they were child and mere infants not to trust authority. He claims the authority only when it's unable to do without it. He says, this habit may be traced even to the schools where children in their games are wont to submit to rules which they have themselves established and to punish misdemeanors which they themselves have defined. In other words, these kids in America, look at them around their schools. My goodness, they're making up their own games. And if somebody gets out of line, they're not going to the teacher. They're solving it themselves. And he says, this same spirit pervades every act of social life. We're a nation of joiners. We are a religious nation. We belong to groups. Even today, right, even today, we join on average more groups than any other country in the world. We're a nation of joiners. We gather together in associations, groups form. Okay, then this is the coolest line of all, right? Of all in the entire democracy in America. If a stoppage occurs on a thoroughfare and the circulation of vehicles is hindered, the neighbors immediately form themselves into a deliberative body and this extemporaneous assembly gives rise to an executive power which remedies the inconvenience before anybody has thought of recurring to a pre-existing authority superior to that of the persons immediately concerned. All right, that's, I got to underscore how that works. This view of, of America, even children get to figure out how they're going to play on their own, make up their own rules. No one's in charge. It goes all the way back. They punish these misdemeanors themselves. And then what happens if there's an accident? Imagine there's a stoppage on a thoroughfare. The circulation of vehicles is hindered. What do you do? Call 911? No. The neighbors, neighbors immediately form themselves into a deliberative assembly. They create a group and then this extemporaneous group gives rise to an executive power. Who's in charge? You're in charge. Okay, I'll be in charge. And they remedy the inconvenience before anyone thought of calling anybody. 
in this version, what are groups? Groups are good things. Now, Madison said, you got to be kind of careful about groups, kind of dangerous, better control them. Tocqueville comes in and says, my God, you made it work. We couldn't make this work in, in, in France. Our revolution was a failure. But here, what do you have? You have these people who are born to suspect that uh, you can't trust central authority. And if there's a problem, what happens? A group will form. This is the step. This is the classic pluralistic Tocqueville step. If there's a problem, a group will form. If there's a problem, a group will form. If there's a problem, a group is going to form. So, Madison is a little bit worried about it. Groups are going to form. That could be a problem. Tocqueville says, hey, if there's a problem, a group's going to form, and that's often a good thing. Usually when we look back on this idea of pluralism or interest group government, we do take on the Tocqueville approach, thinking if there's a problem, a group will form, and maybe that's okay. Pluralism is this idea that interest groups take on much of the work of government. Now, I mentioned earlier that the nonprofit sector of the economy is huge, hugely important, does much of the work of government, work done in other countries. In the United States, is done by these interest groups, the trade associations, and, uh, associations that help the homeless, and so forth. If there's a problem, a group will form. Pluralism says, hey, that's not a bad way of dealing with it. Remember we talked about that kind of idea of latent belief systems? Now I want you thinking about something that we can't observe, but it's called the best policy. Because what Tocqueville and the pluralists who come after Tocqueville are describing is an interest group system, when there's a problem, a group will form, that surrounds a problem. Like, we're going to surround that cart that needs to be fixed on a thoroughfare. We're going to surround that problem and we're going to have a conversation with each other. And there's going to be an executive authority that kind of emerges out of this interest group cooperation, right? It's going to emerge and then we'll see what the best policy actually looks like. Imagine the best policy is that thing that kind of looks like a fish. In an interest group society, in Tocqueville's interest group society, you don't go to government asking for help. What government does actually is simply reflect the outcome of the interest group struggles in the community. How is it that in the United States they can manage to have such a small federal government? It's kind of amazing compared to France in 1831. How is it they can do this? Well, if there's a problem, a group is going to form, they'll surround the problem, they'll have a discussion, they'll decide what the answer ought to be, and then they're going to turn to government. So, we know what the best policy is, the interest group system solved it. Then you can have a relatively small government, and the job of government is simply to reflect the interest group struggle in society. That's how public policy is created in a pluralistic system. If there's a problem, a group will form, they'll define what the best policy is, and then a small government can kind of reflect that policy. It's a nice idea, isn't it? And maybe sometimes it kind of works. Maybe. If there's a problem, a group will form. Do you think that's true? So this is the idea in pluralism, right? It's going to reflect. In uh, the political science literature, this is sort of the heyday of all of this. It kind of culminates with Who Governs by Robert Dahl. Who governs in, in his system, a pluralist system? Who governs? Why we all govern? If you want to become activated about something, if it's really important to you, you're going to join a group. And then we're going to surround that problem. Now, in his book, Who Governs, he actually looks at the history of New Haven, Connecticut, and he says, look, I'm reading through the history and it's really interesting. You don't need to have a strong central government because when there's a problem, groups are going to form and then they're going to be represented by the people's voluntary choice to be part of the attentive publics. So 
In pluralist systems, group form naturally. Memberships overlap and the competition among groups is central to determining what governments actually do. In the sociology world, you know, we faced a little bit of a crisis during World War II and just before World War II when they saw a democracy elect Hitler. That's right, Hitler was elected. When Mussolini took power in, in Italy, a nascent democracy, the question was, oh my goodness, can this happen here? And pluralists looked among themselves and said, no, nah, it can't happen here. You know why? Because we have a small government. Why do we have a small government? Because most of the work is done in the interest group society. Government can be small because if there's a problem, a group will form. The groups will then have this competition, tell the government what to do. And it's really hard for government to be big and for anyone to take it over. I think they were whistling past the graveyard. I don't think that was actually true at the time, but they certainly believed it. Pluralism's heyday was in literature in the 1960s, but think about it. Do you actually think that's true? If there's a problem, a group will form? E. e. Schatzneider wrote The Semi-Sovereign People. <laughs> Gotta love this book. It's a wonderful book. And, and he talked about this pluralist heaven. Right? This idea that this pluralist heaven is going to balance things off. And he noticed, I could go back to this. He said that the system is skewed, loaded, and unbalanced in favor of a fraction of a minority. And this great line said, the flaw in the pluralist heaven is that the heavenly chorus sings with a strong upper-class accent. Now that was empirically true. It's empirically true today. The idea, the thing that he was noticing is that pluralist heaven, there are a lot of groups that don't exist. And when there are groups that don't exist, who can agree on what the best policy actually is? So Tocqueville says, if there's a problem, a group will form. But the critics of pluralism, beginning with Schatzschneider, and especially hitting a home run, Mansur Olson in 1965, said, hmm, that's not true. Schatzschneider says, you know, hey, a lot of groups are actually missing. Pay attention to the groups that are missing. And then Mansur Olson notes, hmm, it's actually a different kind of problem because if there's a problem a group almost never forms he said I, I Mansur Olson was an economist one of Richard Zeckhauser's colleagues um, got his PhD up here didn't know he was gonna write a piece that was going to challenge sociology and political science he's an economist so he's like really paying attention to unions he didn't it was like he looks at this with a clean sheet of paper and says, my goodness, whoever thought that if there's a problem, a group is going to form, where did that idea come from? Tocqueville. He said, no, what really is interesting is that when there's a problem, like a group hardly ever forms. Now, he says there are a couple exceptions. They might form if members are coerced into joining. He was really interested in unions. A lot of his book is dedicated to unions. He said, you got closed shops. You're forcing people to join a group. Or, he says, you might be able to sort of entice people to join a group by giving them selective benefits, often selective material benefits. Join our group that cares about nature and we're going to give you really nice photos and an emblem that you can put up and show everybody, display to people that you care about nature. And people are joining because of those benefits. Mansur Olson turns the entire pluralist idea completely on its head. If there's a problem, a group will form. No, 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 no. If there's a problem, a group hardly ever forms, especially around the hardest public problems, the problems that really require collective action. So, old pluralism was, if there's a problem, a group is going to form. What was proposed after Mansur Olson, and we still largely agree with, 
is that something's called exchange theory pluralism. If there's a problem, a group just might be able to form, but it's hard to do, and public goods might only be provided as a byproduct. In other words, you join a group to get something, and sometimes maybe they're going to give a broader public good. Where do these groups come from? Think about AAA. I'm a member of AAA, but where did it come from? If there's a problem, a group will form. There's a stoppage on a thoroughfare. Hmm. Where did AAA come from? Do you know that no government official sat down and designed the stop sign? There are a couple of individuals who were incredibly important in the design of something like the stop sign. But the stop sign was promoted by a trade association of automobile manufacturers who were worried, rightly so, about laws being passed in cities across America that banned automobiles from cities. And, you know, the, the horse industry was very much against the automobiles. The carriage industry didn't want anything to do with these automobiles. And people were getting killed in traffic accidents. So the Automobile Association was created by car manufacturers for safety. They produced stop signs and then for free gave the stop signs to municipalities. Why? Because now people can buy cars. It's not if there's a problem a group will form as much as you have a group that really can benefit. It's not some miscellaneous collection of people spontaneously saying, hey, let's do something about this. It's economic interests. It's fascinating. What about the National Rifle Association? Where did they come from? That's also a lot of foundation myth based around the history of the National Rifle Association. And there were actually plenty of groups after the Civil War that wanted to train people in using weapons. If you think about a Mansur Olson kind of approach to where groups come from, you might look to something like, oh, well, maybe it's the gun manufacturers, or maybe it's the ammo manufacturers. or. But actually, in this case, it, it was the United States government. The Department of the Army sponsored, fed the National Rifle Association, especially after the Spanish-American War. See, with the Civil War, okay, remember with the Civil War, over 700,000 young men die. You have a huge demographic hole that was left. They open up the borders and allow people to come in to fill manufacturing roles. And meanwhile, people are moving from the countryside into the cities. Young men that grew up in the countryside knew how to shoot, like, right through a rabbit. But if you grow up in a city, you're not using a weapon. And so when it came time to fight in the Spanish-American War in the late 1800s and the 1890s, 1898, while we won, it was a disaster. Our soldiers weren't prepared. The marksmanship was horrific. And in the wake of that, the U.S. Department of Army funded the National Rifle Association, built up the National Rifle Association to train the next generation of young men in how to handle a weapon. We didn't have a standing army. How were all these new immigrants and people in cities ever going to learn how to shoot before the next war comes along? Everyone has a, a different way of creating these interesting groups. AARP has a nice foundation myth about Ethel Percy Andrus. Wonderful story. I'm also a member of AARP. Why would I be a member of AARP? Because I guess I can save 10 cents on a cup of coffee at McDonald's, something like that. But why does AARP even exist? It's one of the largest groups in the United States. You get magazines, you get some goodies. AARP grew and expanded as a marketing arm of different insurance companies. That's right. They existed ultimately to sell insurance. Colonial Pen, Life Insurance Company. These memberships in these groups, the memberships lists are expanded because they wanted to sell to a market of older people. Now, AARP does some fine and wonderful things, 
but it's not designed just to represent the interests of older Americans. It's designed ultimately to get older Americans to buy our life insurance policy and not their life insurance policy. Fascinating. We have um, special interests in America that tend to represent strong economic interests. It's always been that way. It certainly was that way 100 years ago and 130 years ago in the age of the trusts. And it exists still today. If we think about these distinctions right, between pluralism in its various forms and what a lot of people are thinking about these days is elitism, elite theory. Elite systems are structured to support the elites. And at least in theory, these divisions between elites and masses are fairly sharp, strong. Now, in elite theory, the flow of power goes from elites to people who are lower in the hierarchy. And elite theory will say, hey, you know what? Um, we're going to structure our schools to teach certain myths and ways of behaving to allow ourselves to stay in power. And in a system like ours where we have a foundation myth that is based on rugged individualism, we want every now and then to have somebody from the lower classes elevate to the elites. Because people would really rather live with the dream of becoming wealthy than the reality of being poor. So pluralism and elite theory. And yeah, right now, sure, you've heard a lot in the last few years about the 1% or the half of a 1%. Elite power systems are operating within democracies when democratic activities provide false legitimacy within the system. We'll let you have what looks like government and choice, but really we'll be in charge. Now, political socialization within this approach is absolutely crucial. And then there's this illusion of popular control. If you're watching this, some of you are like born believers of elite theory. Oh, some elitist cabal is in charge of everything. Frankly, it's not true. But there are some people who have far more power than others. And there are others of you who are watching this and you say, oh, this sounds communist or something. Who? This is not true. This is anti-American. Well, that's also nonsense. Of course, there is an elite and a power elite within all of our communities. It, it's, a, it's a reality. Now, how do you marry that with maintaining a really vibrant democracy and an economic system that allows for the refreshing of ideas? An important work in all of this is a C. Wright Mills book in 1956 called The Power Elite. I love this little graphic from it. Take a look here on that if you'd like to. But a, a, a very modern proponent of all of this concept of elite theory um, is a direct reaction to who governs. So in who governs, right, the top of the heap, the greatest flowering of, pl elite, of pluralist theory, um, Robert Dahl was looking at who governs in, um, in New Haven, Connecticut. And he says, hey, you know what? We all govern. And one of my mentors, Jack Walker, came along and wrote something called A Critique of the Elitist Theory of Democracy. It's a hell of a critique because what Jack Walker was trying to say is, hey, you know what? A lot of groups don't exist. And you, if you're defending the system, Robert Dahl, you yourself are actually an elitist. Because if we focus on the groups that don't exist, you'll see that there aren't groups out there of homeless. There aren't groups of the unemployed. There aren't groups of poor people. There are so many biases in the interest group system. Well, that created this firestorm, of course, between devotees of Jack Walker and devotees of Robert Dahl. But one of the great takedowns is in William Domhoff's book, Who Really Rules? Because he went right back to the history of New Haven and examined where did these people come from, what was power like, and found 
a very powerful clique a hierarchy that wanted to hold on to power so in reality where are we well we're actually in a combination of pluralist theory and elite theory they, they both can have elements of truth it's worth taking a look at Domhoff's work on elites and elite theory but I don't want you to buy completely into pluralism or completely into its rejection. Let's take a look now, though, at the interest groups that exist, say, at the federal level in Washington, D.C., and pay attention to the power there. So this is from a website, um, causeiq.com. Here's just uh, within the D.C. area, trade professional associations. There are 3,029 of them currently. They employ 48,700 people. This is just in D.C., just within trade and professional associations. And they had over $15 billion in revenue two years ago. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? Actually, if, if you think about um, a football stadium, and, and members of Congress are the players on the field, you have lobbyists that fill that stadium, just with trade and professional associations. It's amazing. Now let's look at business and industry associations. There you have an additional 3,400 and another 52,000 people working in that industry just in Washington, D.C., $16 billion in revenue. You're surrounding the representatives of government by this crowd that's trying to have an influence on them. And the interest group system does not accurately reflect the interests of society. It's not the case that if there's a problem, a group will form. If there's a problem, maybe you can find a sponsor, someone with money, someone with real articulated interests who can get something done. And there's huge lobbying firms in D.C. and in all of our state governments. There's massive associations that spend millions of dollars helping to fund um, the re-election chances of people who have done well for them. In this kind of competition between pluralist and elite theory, I'm really taken by some new work by Gillens and Page. And there's a, they have a book, this is an article that was in the American Political Science Review, Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens. And you got to love this first sentence. Who governs? That's Dahl. Who really rules? That's Domhoff. To what extent is the broad body of U.S. citizens sovereign, semi-sovereign? That's Schatzneider. Or largely powerless? That's Gaventa power and powerlessness. These questions have animated much important work in the study of American politics. And what they find is what is called now biased pluralism. Biased pluralism. Yes, members of Congress are representative of interest groups. However, those interest groups are biased and reflect moneyed interests. So it's a more complicated picture than this rather simplistic one that maybe you're learning about in civics classes. And it's an ongoing struggle because when you're in power, you like to make the rules and keep them in your favor. So, we've gone on. I know I've gone on. I have gone on way too long once again. There were way too many slides. I apologize. It's probably been an hour. I don't know. However, let's remember, the founders created this system thinking there would be no political parties. But the institutions would take care of themselves. And where are we now? Two strongly entrenched political parties, largely controlling these organs of government. And interest groups abound and they're powerful, and they're biased. Let's turn next to the actual <laughs> institutions. How are we going to think about it? In American history, we have had five party periods. The first one ends in 1928 with the emergence of the Jacksonian wing and the Democrats. Then you have um, two Republican areas in the next party period that end in 1928. A New Deal coalition emerges and is solid until about 1964. 
And then a, a realignment occurred around 68, where the Republican Party moved overwhelmingly from New England, both to the South and to the West. And we enter a new period of divided party government. The question is now, where are we? Are we at a moment with the latest election, with the dramatic changes in the Republican Party, with the biases within the Democratic Party, and that we're on the verge of another party era? Okay. When we talk about political parties in the literature, political science sociology, usually people are in one of three camps. They kind of write about parties in the electorate or parties in government or parties as organizations. And, and I don't want to spend a huge amount of time going through those distinctions. I want to hit on a few points here. Uh, the first is that when people are measuring things like party identification, remember I already don't really trust polls, um, but the simple out of the gateway is to say, okay, well, where are you? Are you a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent? And in a relatively recent poll, Republicans are at 29%, Democrats at 29%, and 41% of Americans say they're independents. Does that mean people are actually independent? No, it doesn't. Because what you need to do is move this into a seven-party measure, people who lean to the Democratic side or lean to the Republican side. So that is now done with a series of questions. First, you ask people, hey, so are you a Democrat, Republican, or an independent? If they say I'm a Republican, they say, are you a particularly strong Republican or just a regular Republican? They do the same thing on the Democratic side. And then among the independents, they ask, so you're an independent, but do you lean towards the Democrats or do you lean towards the Republicans? Or are you just an independent? When you look at those independent leaners, it's fascinating because they tend to be more partisan in their behaviors than the people who straight out of the gate say, I'm a Democrat, but not a strong one, or I'm a Republican, but not a strong one. So it's not enough just to look at this level of analysis and say, look, most Americans are independents. Nonsense. People in higher socioeconomic status, better educated, they say, oh my gosh, I better not tell anybody I'm a Democrat or Republican, so I'm going to say I'm an independent, but I lean to the Democrats, or I'm an independent, but I would never vote for a Republican. And when you include the leaners, you get a better picture of partisanship. Oh, who are these Democrats? Who are these Republicans? Um, the coalition supporting them has been largely stable until the last 10 years, really beginning in 2010, um, the coalition around the Republican Party and the Democratic Party began to change rather dramatically at the electoral level. Now, the elites, those in Congress, had already become more polarized. And since the 2010 election in particular, the electorate has become more polarized as well. This is a Another place that I encourage you to go take a look. It's a bit dated now, but it'll give you a sense for just how polarized things went from, in this case, 1994 to 2014. Republicans are shifting to the right, and Democrats shifted to the left. Well, who's still in the middle? That's important in party politics, because when you're in elective office, the name of the game is actually putting together a coalition to try and get something done. There's a standard old line that strange bedfellows coalitions make good laws, and that is true. Laws that are passed by a strange bedfellow coalition is more likely to be successfully implemented, more likely to survive court challenges, less likely to be overturned in a subsequent bill. But strange bedfellows coalitions, someone from one side and the other, are knitted together by centrists. Centrists in the electorate and centrists in Congress have been disappearing. Polarization is especially acute among people who are actively engaged in politics. The more you read about politics, probably the more polarized you become. It's not the case that simply, oh, if you're a Republican, I think I'll listen to CNN a lot more. I'll probably learn about the other side and maybe I'll become more moderate. Nonsense. Nonsense. 
when somebody who is already leaning in one direction starts to listen to the other side, they actually become more firm in their beliefs. You see this all the time when Democrats around here say, oh, I watched Fox last night. They're all nuts. It's not simply exposure. Political engagement itself is becoming part of the problem of polarization. We're more polarized among the more engaged and it's getting ever more severe. There are lots of ways of measuring polarization and polarization today, if we look at something like a DW nominate scores, we're at a very high level of polarization. We've seen similar levels of polarization before oh, the Civil War. And that led to the Civil War. How are we going to undo where we are now? And this problem of parties and interest groups entrenched and fighting over these scraps. There's um, a quick, quick thing here I want to mention, um, which is about primary elections. So um, if you are a candidate for the party of the left here in this photo, uh, you're going to probably choose, a. You know, the party will probably choose the candidates around the median of that distribution. If you're around the right party, you probably choose a candidate that's around the median. And then in the general election, um, what happens is that the party of the right and the party of the left, they're, they're, their standard bearer is trying to get closer to the center. And the amount of time between the primary elections and the general elections is known as the primary gap. So Richard Nixon said, you run to the right in the primary, to the center in the general election. Same thing goes, of course, for the Democrats. You run to the left if you want to get the nomination, and then you try and moderate between the primaries and the general election. But um, primaries are getting further and further away from the general election. And that's another important element in driving polarization. In areas where the primary gap is small, like you're running a primary in September and the election's in November, what you advertise in the primary is going to be spill over into the general election, and you're actually more likely to get moderate candidates emerging out of a primary when the primary gap is small. These political parties, again, from the great state of Wisconsin, what I want you to understand is that these Political parties at the national level really don't exist in the way that you think that they do. There's no one in charge of the Democratic Party or in charge of the Republican Party. The national party organizations gather every four years to nominate a standard bearer for the presidential election. And that's their purpose. Otherwise, the parties are largely being run at the state level. And the rules and regulations about how the state parties are run vary dramatically from one state to another. So who's in charge of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? The people in D.C. will tell you it's not us. It's got to be those crazies back in the state. And when you're in the state party leadership, you talk about the crazies who are back in the counties. The county party leadership is where a lot of the activity actually is. The closer and closer you get to the grassroots, the more you have that issue of people selectively participating, choosing to be part of the club. And they're driven by concerns that tend to be far more extreme and less moderating than what you're going to find at the national level. So if you want to, you know, get together for a gathering in the Republican Party back where I grew up in Waukesha County, what can you do? Where are the meetings going to take place? You can get together at the gun club and meet with the Republican Party. Who's in charge of the Republican Party in Wisconsin? Not any one person. It's a complicated uh, group of negotiations among people. Same thing with the Democratic Party. So a Democrat in Minnesota is going to look a lot different than a Democrat in Arkansas, right? even though they have the same overall standard bearer. I want to talk about elections just a little bit to kind of take us through some of the aspects of American history and understand going in that every campaign focuses on something called their win number. And the number is, is really precisely determined, relatively precisely, based on how many votes you need to go out and identify and get to the polls. 
So in this imaginary case that I put up here in front of you, you might have a district with 50,000 people, but in a two candidate race, only 30% are going to turn out. And so the number to win in a candidate race like this is going to be 5,250. But if you're wanting to be sure that you win, you might settle on 6,000. And so what you do, if you're running a campaign, you don't want to spend more money than you have to. You don't want to spend divert resources in places you shouldn't. You try and find those 6,000 votes and get them to the polls. Once you identify somebody, you say, oh, you're going to vote with us? We're going to, we can give you a ride. We're going to make sure you come on out. It's a fool's game to advertise to everybody because you might advertise and get people excited about the race who are going to vote for the other person. So first thing you do is you identify your number. And then you have to hit that target. And this is just part of an electoral map in Boston. We just had an election um, last month in November. Um, but if we go back to the election before that, I want you to pay attention to the elections uh, November of 2019. We have all these different interesting councils. And in one district in particular, it's fascinating. Liz Breeden won the election, 58% of the vote, and she got 3,890 votes. So that's the general election. But how many votes did she actually need and how many people is she representing? She represents the entire 9th district. All right, so she's now in that, in that office. In the primary election, we had a lot of candidates. Remember, single-member district plurality rule. And um, the top two vote-getters were Cashman and Breeden. And so Cashman got 1,221 votes, and Breeden moved ahead with 1,133 votes. So in that entire district, what she really needed was about 1,200 votes, and she was definitely going to be through. The entire population of wards 21 and 22, which create the district, is 73,893 and registered voters is 43,000. So she managed to get this, I'm going to go back, she managed to get that total, right, 1,333 votes among 43,000 registered voters. How do you do that? Well, you identify your voters and then you get them to the polls. A little article here on how you target voters. You determine your win number. We've already gone through that. And then you have to figure out how you're going to persuade people. And you got to collect data and follow them up. You micro-target to the universe of voters who are actually interested in you. You've selected. This is how you win. This is how a modern campaign is structured. This is an old map. Luis Gutierrez no longer represents the 4th Congressional District in in Illinois, and they are redistricting it as well right now. Um, but it's a strange looking district, isn't it? And the idea was that, well, we're gonna represent, you know, the, the, the Latins, right? they're all gonna be, the Hispanics will be here. Don't worry, Luis Gutierrez is gonna get elected. But what really matters in this gerrymandered district, of course, is to win the primary vote. Look at the primary in 2014. Gutierrez won overwhelmingly, means you're going to win the general election. He won with 21,625 votes, which is just under 3% of the district. He didn't have to try and target a huge number of votes. If he actually went out and targeted and tried to get 50,000 votes, he's wasting his money because he's not in the elections business. He's not in the democracy business. He's in the getting the number business. Here's a much more interesting campaign recently. The 14th Congressional District, you probably know who wins here. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez surprised everybody when she took out Joe Crowley. She had a great ground game and she expanded the number. She got her number. The outcome was she won 15,897 votes and Crowley got just under 12,000 votes. Very, very close. In a district of almost 700,000 people, she won with 2.3% of the district vote in the primary. The name of the game is to identify the voters and get them to the polls. That's how you win.
This is a run expectancy matrix. It's uh, from Sabermetrics. It gives you a sense of how things work in baseball. And so if the game is really won by winning more, having more uh, runs than the other side, you don't have to get the maximum number of possible runs. You just have to beat the other side. You have to win by more runs, right? And uh, every inning, you know, the, the probability, the expected number of runs with zero outs and nobody on base is, on average, you expect that they're going to be 0. 0.481s runs actually score. So if you're facing a strategic situation in the bottom, say, of the fourth, and there's runners on first and second and nobody is out, then the question is, like, okay, should you bunt? And we know from the probabilities that actually if you bunt, you decrease. If you have a successful bunt, you give up an out, you move the runners over to second and third, you actually decrease the probability of scoring a run in that inning. And, and that's kind of interesting, right? It's a little bit of a side story, but maybe not, because the game of getting voters to the polls has this kind of precision. There is a probability estimate around every person on whether or not they're going to vote. And are they going to vote for a Democrat? Are they going to vote for you? They're going to vote against you. And you want, if you're running a campaign, to do whatever you can at the margin to increase the probability of getting that runner home, getting that person to vote for you. One of the games I like to imagine is this game with my grandson, Hagop. Someday, Hagopig and I will play um, through a maze. A maze like this is an interesting thing because you can beat a kid in a maze game if you start at the end. And that's also the true in American politics. The win number in American politics at the presidential level is 270 because that's how many votes you need in the Electoral College to win. You start at the end. How am I going to get to 270 votes? And you build your campaign backwards in time, going backwards through the maze. This is important. Candidates and campaigns and parties are not in the democracy business. They're in the getting the number business. So your political parties, they're not out there to defend democracy. Your candidates aren't out there to defend democracy. They're out there to win. Who's out there to defend democracy. I hope you are. The win number is running this way. Get your 270 votes. However you put those states together, it's a hard process, a complicated process. I'm going to stop here because I'm getting that look that I've already gone over time. So I'll stop here for now and we'll move on next to the three branches of government. Parties and interest groups aren't the savior for all. It's biased pluralism. Our elections emphasize certain kinds of outcomes. How are we going to get through this? Let's take a break, and I'll see you at the next stop.